My background is I've been involved in selling data solutions to uh, retail execution only stockbrokers in the UK. I've uh, been reasonably successful at it. I would think if there are 30 stockbrokers in the UK representing 95% of the flow in the UK, 28 of them have got to be clients of mine. Um, if you have a look on the, the BBC's website, um, I'm the chap that they bought their data from. So that's my background. That's kind of how I got involved with uh, Crowdnetic and the one, very similar, similar histories. Um, if I could just pass over to our, our panel members and ask them to introduce themselves, and then we'll crack on and start talking about um, the international landscape, regulation, problems, uh, investor protection, education, uh, etc. So if we can start with you, Rodrigo, at the end. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Nino. I'm the president of Prodigy Network. We are a crowdfunding company in commercial real estate based here in New York. We do projects here in Manhattan, and we also do projects in emerging markets like uh, Colombia, where I am originally from. Hello, my name is Gonzalo. I'm the co-founder of Syndicate Room. We are a UK equity crowdfunding uh, platform, uh, the only investor-led platform in the UK. That means that uh, all the old deals have a lead investor putting their own money first, usually an experienced investor like a business angel or a venture capitalist, and then the crowd can effectively piggyback on that and invest under the same uh, terms, so same class of shares, same price per share, as the experienced investor that takes the lead investor role. I am Zach Miller. I'm a partner at Our Crowd. Um, Our Crowd is an equity crowdfunding platform based in Israel. Uh, we've done 55 investments over the past uh, almost two years. Um, invested upwards of $70 million on our platform so far. And uh, like Giancarlo, we have, we have a similar model. It's investor-led. We sit on the same side of the table as our investors. Uh, we put our own capital into a deal after we due diligence it. 2% uh, of all the companies we, we uh, interview and we, we diligence end up appearing on our platform. And uh, just last month, we had our first IPO. We, we believe the first IPO in the, uh, in the crowdfunding industry, equity crowdfunding industry. OK, great. So the, the first um, thing that I think is worth noting is there's a, a lot of similarities, <coughs> especially uh, in the UK market. Um, with the US market, we're experiencing um, exponential growth. Um, maybe the figures aren't as impressive as the, the US figures, but um, we're only a little, com uh, little country. Um, back in December of last year, um, the major peer-to-peer um, -peer lending platforms went through the one billion pounds mark um, after, well, what, Zopa, 2005. So after quite a long time. In May, that was 1.5 billion pounds, and in September, that was 2 billion pounds. So it's an accelerating, um, accelerating market for us. Um, my first question, though, is, is mainly um, it looking at uh, international expansion um, and what the barriers to entry are there and how you might overcome them, um, and, and maybe what plans you have in that space, the three of you, I'll maybe start with Rodrigo. I know you've got some interesting stuff going on in Europe imminently. Yes, thank you very much. Essentially, um, we have seen that the greatest barrier of entry is the cap on what we call here Title Three to unaccredited investors, because that really doesn't make any sense. Here in New York, for example, um, our, our assets, which are large and probably over $100 million, um, have been proven to be the safest assets uh, after the financial crisis. And it doesn't make sense to preclude a smaller investor from some other state to participate in one of those assets. There is no correlation between the size of the investor and the size of the asset they invest in. So that's one of the restrictions that we have found in our projects in Colombia, uh, where that restriction doesn't apply. We raised over $220 million for one skyscraper. So it's effectively people investing in projects in their own hom hometown uh, uh, with no direct correlation, the size of the investor with the size of the offering, per se. Okay. Can we pass that over to Zach? What are your thoughts on that? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, barriers to entry. Um, 
in terms yeah. of moving into international markets? So we actually have um, registered investors from over 50 countries on our platform and active investors from over 30. Uh, that meant we spent a lot of money on legal. Um, we've worked with some of the top firms uh, around the world, basically, essentially to comply with local regulatory regime. Uh, it just means that every investor that comes on the platform gets a little bit of a different experience based upon uh, where, they're, where they're registering from. Uh, and that's in flux. That requires us to be on top of the ball all the time. So that, that's, that's one of the uh, challenges and opportunities of working internationally. Uh, so we are laser focused in the UK. Um, so we, we operate only with UK investors and UK companies. And, uh, and the main reason for that is because of the challenges that we find on international expansion. Because we think that, um, you know, we believe that, and from what we can see, all our data shows that, is that one of the key challenges is to find good quality deal flow. We are a highly curated platform. Um, with, um, we work with a, what you call here the accredited investors, so high net worth and sophisticated investors in the UK. And the, the tricky part is that we find is not necessarily to expand to other geographical reasons. You know, we could put money behind lawyers and, and expand to the US, but to find the quality deal flow in the US, it's a much tougher job than sorting out the legals. Okay, and just going back to you, uh, Rodrigo, for, uh, for a moment, I, I hear um, that you're uh, opening up shop in, in Europe, in, in Spain and Germany, is that correct? Yes. Can I, we can I ask uh, the reason for the selection of those two particular markets and any problems you've experienced uh, around them? Sure. We need to separate uh, our two businesses. One is the one that we have in emerging markets, like I was saying, starting with Colombia, where we essentially have local Colombian assets that we sold exclusively to Colombians um, and some Venezuelans, of course. And then we believe that based on the uh, location of our assets here in Manhattan, that we have a global outreach because while only Colombians and some Venezuelans buy in Colombia, we believe that uh, there's a global appetite for Manhattan, <laughs> particularly these days. So um, our expansion goes along those lines. Since we are Manhattan-centric, we want to reach a global uh, uh, audience. And there is a lot of appetite in Spain and a lot of appetite in Germany for this type of product over here. We've been selling over the past 12 months to uh, 17 countries in 12 different states here in, in the United States. And uh, two of the most active markets for that matter are essentially Germany and Spain. So what we want to do is find the right legal vehicle to be able to openly advertise without falling for an international illegal offering you know, in those countries which is always the, the challenge, you know, that you have asymmetries in the different legislations between what happens in the states and what happens in these countries. Thanks, cool. Okay, well, um, the, the second uh, uh, content subject matter that I think um, uh, is, is worth addressing is, um, and we, we've spoken about it earlier on, education um, uh, combined with uh, consumer or investor protection. Um, what do you think the, the responsibilities of the platforms should be? Um, and well, let's start with that. What, what do you think the responsibility of the, of the platform should be? I think that the model really uh, uh, changes from platform to platform depending on who you are and the expertise that you bring to the table. I have seen pl very successful platforms like Realty Mogul, for example, uh, where they essentially uh, take, take an arm's length approach, you know, to the underlying assets. And they let the investor decide uh, what assets to pick. They don't necessarily interfere or intervene for that matter. And that's very valid. Uh, there's also the approach, you know, for Fundrise and many others where they are very, very local. Uh, our approach, based on we having experience in New York, is focusing on New York and selling it globally. So what I really think is that uh, education ties in with the fact that this is effectively the creation of a whole new industry. What we're witnessing here, you know, is very difficult to grasp because innovation is not to be perceived as it happens. It only can be understood, under, understood you know, in, in, in retrospective. But what is going on with this gentleman here and with everybody here is that we are active pioneers 
of the creation of a whole new asset class and a whole new industry. So there's going to be a ton of different models. There's not going to be a rule of thumb. It depends, again, on who you are and what your leverage is on any particular market. And it really depends on how you can, Im uh, uh, what is your ex expertise to implement that fantastic formula, that technology, you know, and the right legislation enable us to do. Because in New, in, in New York, it is about access. We're providing access. We try to provide access to these assets that were privy to the larger investors before. But in Colombia, it's about making projects viable that were impossible entirely to the traditional equity play. So it really depends on who you are, where you are, and what you need the model to, to do for you. And follow that up? So I think that the, um, the responsibility by the platforms is huge. Um, so Syndicate Room operates on the equity uh, side, so slightly different from you, but very similar to, to our crowd. And, and I think that the responsibility is huge because I don't, we haven't created a new asset class in the equity side, right? Uh, investing into unlisted companies has existed for to this asset class. And they are being exposed to an asset class that they've never been exposed to before. Now that 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 is great. That is amazing. So yeah. So so we 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 we're exposing these in individuals to a new asset class. Uh, nothing wrong with that. That's that's really really great. But it has to be done with responsibility, and it has to be done with a you know in in the in the in the right way. And uh, and that's why I think that the platforms play a huge part in terms of educating uh, the, this new group of investors that are, that is exposed to this asset class, and uh, and the responsibility to make sure that they are protected as investors. I think that's really, really key if the if in the industry is to build the right reputation and to achieve all the potential that it, it, it has. I'd like to echo that. Um, you know, you have on in the equity side, you have like the angelist model, which is really just a very open marketplace. Uh, and then models like ours, which are uh, I would say somewhat paternalistic. We, 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 we highly curate uh, the companies that appear on that. Um, Unlike the stock markets, which you know have their own level of, of curation, you have to reach a certain level of, of market cap to be listed. Um, you don't necessarily have that in our space. And I think as a as a platform, we wanted to ensure uh, the success of our investors. And I we understand clearly if our investors are successful, we'll continue to be successful. But this is an asset class that you know has a huge attrition rate. Um, unlike the stock market, where you know rarely do you invest in a company it goes to zero. Uh, you're going to have a lot of zeros in this space. And so, um, ironically, we had our first IPO bef before we had our first company fail. And uh, communicating that to our investors is, is first and foremost. Um, it's, it is a challenge also internationally, this idea of um, being protective of our investor base so, um, and explaining that to them and educating that. So a, 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 level, a, a, a Series A deal in Israel, the, the valuation... Um, and the dynamics of where a company is at a Series A is much different uh, than a company based in Silicon Valley. Um, so when, when we put both companies up on our website, which we've done, um, you know, our investors don't necessarily have the tools, per se, to compare one against the other. Um, so education is first and foremost, I think, in terms of helping people be <laughs> successful in, in equity crowdfunding. Okay. I, I would Back like to, to add something then. to that. I believe that, uh, and I, I will echo uh, uh, my fellow uh, panelists, because I think that even beyond education, you need to make the assumption that investors just don't read documents. And then you will take a safe approach to that. You know, for, for as much as you want to educate them, whenever there's a hype like the one that we're experiencing, they just don't read it. You know, there was an article in Bloomberg Business Week about it, you know, with the reads and whatever, but they just don't. They just don't. And irrespective of how responsible you think you can be, in our case, you know, we're JB partners. We don't only curate our deals, but we're actively investors in the deals we handle. Um, so, so, but we think that, it, that there is a need, you know, and it should be mandatory under the JOBS Act uh, to have a third-party professional fund administrator to make sure that whatever you put in the documents and the subscription agreements with the investors is effectively implemented. That is a lesson, you know, we learned in Colombia where 20 years ago there started the, crowd, the, the, the equity syndication because as you clearly point out, you know, there is nothing new. The first crowdfunding competition here in New York was effectively to fund the, the Statue of Liberty a long, a long while ago. Mm -hmm. So what we learned was that if there isn't a third-party fund administrator, the chance of fraud is much greater. 
With a professional third-party fund administrator, investor will, investors will not only get educated, but they will have somebody you know, to back up whatever it is that they signed. So to us, you, that should be mandatory, at least in commercial real estate. Uh, I would like to add a little bit to that. Which, How many of us have actually read the insurance papers that we signed for travel insurance or house insurance or whatever, right? <laughs> Exa you have. <laughs> are, are you a lawyer and you make a living out of it, don't you? Yeah, that's what that. um, yeah. How many more? It's, 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 exactly the sa right, it's exactly the same with, with this type of investment. Articles of association, I, I'm not sure if it's the same terminology here, but the, the shareholders agreement, etc. They're very long documents and equity crowdfunding tends to be uh, geared towards smaller investors rather than larger investors. And that means that it's just not really efficient to read a 50-page long legal document to invest a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or a hundred dollars. And uh, and what we what it, I think it really needs to happen in the industry is that to make sure that the investor protections are there by default, rather than just some platforms have it, some others don't have it, because no one is going to read the document and no one is going to actually know the difference or, or see through it. So I think that it, as part of the education, it really needs to, to have that element as well of making sure that the, the investor protections are there mm. by, by default. We've, we've definitely seen the, um, the animal spirits. Uh, we, we've had one deal that we put up, typically a, uh, you know, less than a, a $600,000 deal. It was gone in four hours. And um, was that a better deal than one that took you know, two weeks to fund? I, I don't know. But uh, so it, it's clear that investors aren't reading. Um, they are swayed by the behavior of their peers. And uh, as a platform, we just want to make sure that they understand. We tell everybody who signs up at our crowd that, like, if you're just going to invest in two or three deals, we don't want you. Um, you're going to fail and you're going to lose money. It's going to be bad for you, bad for us, unless you're willing to make a, uh, you know, a portfolio of 10 to 15 uh, securities within your portfolio. At least, you know, you'll be successful at that point. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the data show that, you know, that 20% Kauffman Foundation had a study of the largest angel groups in, 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 in the world. They averaged 27% per year, but that was with, you know, portfolios of 10 to 15 securities. So uh, we tell people that we're upfront about that and we turn them away if, if, they're, not, uh, if they're not willing to abide by that. Okay. Um, well, if we just stay on um, education for a moment. Um, about an hour ago in London, uh, right near Piccadilly Circus, which is our equivalent of Times Square, obviously a little bit smaller, um, the UK Crowdfunding Association held an event educating uh, people looking for funding. So I think there's, maybe you could share some thoughts on uh, how people looking for funding might be educated. So the, the event was actually called How Not to Crowdfund. Um, it was it's slightly different, so it had nothing to do with investor protections or education or even investors. Uh, the event was about how to, to raise finance or how not to raise finance and the common mistakes that people have done. And, uh, and they involve a, a huge number of things, particularly the more, more sort of or, uh, consumer focused oriented uh, products or, 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 um, or projects where they fail to, to get that initial traction, the initial marketing, the PI exposure, etc. And uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, there, there's plenty of, of data showing that the, the initial 48 hours are absolutely crucial for a project to gain the traction that it requires to, to close or, or, or failing. And, and there's clear, very, very clear data that if a project reaches 40% of the funding, it's very likely to actually complete. We take a similar approach with our entrepreneurs that we do with our investors. It's also somewhat paternalistic. So we understand um, what it takes to raise money uh, in the equity crowdfunding market on our platform. Uh, so we don't really require the entrepreneurs. It's not like they're running a campaign. We're raising money for them on our platform, uh, that, which means you know, we'll, we'll make sure that we do a, a formal deal launch to our email list. Uh, we'll go on a road show with the company. Uh, they just need to kind of come along for the ride. So uh, we do our fair share of educating them how the process works, but we also hold their hand throughout the entire process. In our case, we're trying to get everybody to understand that we're really moving from an economy into a full-blown crowd economy. This is not only about real estate, which is what I do. These folks are doing equity crowdfunding, which is totally different you know, than what I do. And there's probably 50 different examples, and each one of you, I'm sure, has a totally different idea on how you could implement crowdfunding to exactly why is that you came here, you know, today. So um, um, 
our, our education for that matter has turned into more than explaining about the underlying asset, which is a given to us based on what we, you said before about the third party professional fund administrator, is for people to start changing their perception and their relationship you know, to the crowd. It is not about you anymore. If you really want to launch any crowdfunding initiative or crowdsourcing initiative, you need to start thinking about how is that you're solving a problem or fixing a need, and then how is that you can profit out of it. And if you find that formula, you're going to be able, in real estate, in equity, or in anything you do, to be able to get through technology, people syndicated, to fund you know, your initiative. The rest is transparency, which quite frankly is very easy to handle nowadays in the age of internet as well. So I think that we need to take, you know, uh, uh, and make the, no the notion ours that we are moving from, the, from, from an economy into a full-blown crowd economy. Okay, okay thanks for that. Um, uh, finally, and, and I guess we're going to be uh, reiterating a few of the points that have been uh, discussed earlier on in the day. Um, there was a uh, discussion earlier on about uh, established financial services companies coming into this space um, and you may have seen or you may not have seen that um, a company called ISDX which is a, a junior market similar to AIM uh, now owned by uh, Michael Spencer's ICAP have uh, just partnered up with the Social Stock Exchange so now we're bringing in social responsibility we spoke about that earlier on um, uh, in a tripartite agreement with um, a company called Angels Den which is a uh, angel network with crowdfunding uh, attached to the side of it to uh, pretty much try and start developing a secondary market for companies raising cash on the social stock exchange. So I can ask uh, Zach initially about um, uh, exits when it's realistic for private investors or any investor to think about exiting their, um, their investment and, uh, and if we start there. Uh, so in our investor education, this may sound kind of blunt, but when people uh, join our platform, we tell them, you know, it is like a marriage. Most marriages end in failure, unfortunately. Um, so you should you should not expect an exit. Uh, we luckily had our first IPO before we had our first failure, but um, we just see in the in in the vintage of our of our portfolio that the, the uh, you know the struggling companies continue to struggle. Uh, we're not putting good money after bad, and and they're eventually going to to die off. Uh, we tell people it takes five to seven years and, uh, you know, it can come in a variety of different ways. Um, I thought you were going to go in the direction of asking how, um, how we partner in terms of helping that happen. Um, one of the models that we have in terms of international expansion, we already have an international investor base. Uh, that seems relatively easy for us to attract uh, given the Internet and some of our marketing techniques. Uh, but our, our vision for expanding internationally is to partner with local organizations. It could be an alumni group of a, of a leading university. Uh, it could be with another angel group in a specific, a specific geography. Or it could be a, a subject matter expert. Um, they just have to follow our model, which is to do due diligence, uh, to put their own money into each one of the deals. So, so just like uh, Rodrigo said, we're also a JV partner. We, we, we put our money where our mouth is. We invest in all the deals on our platform. And the third is to support all of our companies. Uh, we, we approach the investment process as a venture capital firm, and we have uh, a couple partners who are dedicated on uh, helping support our companies, our portfolio companies. That's either with helping them find uh, new sources of capital as they grow, business development relationships, or whatever it may be to help them get over that growth hump. Um. Yeah, so, so again, going back to the same point, this is the same asset class that already exists. To me, alternative finance is not about the recipient of the funds or, or the instrument. It's actually about the, the investors, and, uh, and it's about exposing investors that, would never, that never had access to this asset class in the past. So, for example, at Syndicate Room, uh, because of our investor-led model, we've had the you know the UK Business Angel of the Year of last year leading funding rounds. We've had the, inv uh, the UK Business Angel of the Year this year uh, leading funding rounds, and um, and uh, and and then because the crowd is piggyback on that, you know that's the bit that it's new. That's the alternative. It's this new crowd of investors co-investing in deals that have have already existed and they always existed, but making the process a lot faster and a lot more efficient. Now, all of this to say that actually, 
personally, I don't really believe in a secondary market uh, being ever being that efficient in a, in a unlisted companies, especially on the on the low end, on the very very an illiquid um, part of the market. And I would love that to, to happen, and I really hope that someone in this room or outside is successful at doing that, because that would help our business model hugely. But there are, there are so many constraints. You know, when you comparing, there's a huge asymmetry of information. Whoever owns that, those securities and have been getting the, the progress reports, the monitoring reports, uh, versus the person that is potentially buying those securities, and they have no progress reports to to look at and to look at the track uh, history of the of the team and of the company and so on uh, there's always the the what are, what what are the motivation behind this, the the selling the selling of those securities it might be completely honest and that you know the whoever owns those securities just wants to buy a house or get married or whatever and needs that money and needs to sell those shares but it also might mean that the that 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 owner of those securities knows more about the company than you do and they know that the company is going down and they want to get rid of the securities before everybody else finds out so personally i i really don't believe that the secondary market will uh, in in this type of companies in enlisted companies uh, will every um really you know operate in an efficient way um in the uk we have the aim market which is to pretty significant companies uh, although it you know it sits below the london stock exchange and even that one really struggles for for liquidity apart from the the top companies so how are we going to get liquidity to a market even lower than that but i really hope that someone resolves this issue because that would be great for us i think that uh again i need to say that i'm doing commercial real estate which is very different than equity in companies uh i take a totally different stance to, to what Gonzalo just said, because in, 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 again, saying that this is real estate, I do see uh, uh, a secondary market in what we do. In fact, I believe that uh, when you're buying commercial real estate, I envision an investor, you know, in Milan, having $500,000 invested, you know, in $100,000, uh, with $100,000 in triple A's, you know, there will be ratings in New York, and then assuming probably a a B plus in the emerging markets, and then maybe a B, 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 whatever you want to call it in, in some other country, you know, because there's different appetite for risk. And, um, and there will be a market maker, and there will be the opportunity, you know, to cash in and out, even before the disposition of the asset. As a matter of fact, we are already working with a vehicle for internationals uh, in Europe, that effectively enables uh, us to put it on the Bloomberg terminals of the um, portfolio managers. You know, we have an IC number and we have an NAV. So whenever somebody buys, they buy directly, you know, from their portfolio uh, without signing subscription agreement or offering memorandum. And the KYC and the AML is done at the moment of opening the investment account by whomever the financial advisor is. And if he wants to get out of that, you know, they're is liquidity for him to do so. Uh, the thing is that it isn't trading too much now because obviously the size of the industry is not there yet and the volume is not enough. But I, 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 I clearly see it happening, at least in commercial real estate. Excellent. I've got, I've got uh, one question that I hadn't really discussed with you yet. I, I guess it's, it's uh, more for you than anyone else, uh, Zach. And it, it's... Um, it just relates to um, investing across borders. Um, I know from my experience in the public markets in the UK that you know, TD Waterhouse might uh, allow private investors to invest in stocks uh, in Europe and in the, in the States. But really, 97% of UK investors are going to invest in, in UK uh, equities. So what's your experience of um, clients in, in one country investing in another, are there any things that you're doing uh, in terms of uh, cross-border uh, cross cooperation that might be of interest to us? Uh, my experience has also been in, in public markets where you have a home bias. Uh, we're actually not seeing any home bias. Um, our largest investor group is here in the U.S. and they're investing in deals all over the world. Uh, we've done deals in New Zealand, we've done uh, investments in Australia, Israel. Uh, soon to be Central and Western Europe, um, they don't even ask. And they judge the company on, on its merits of, uh, you know, 
rev, diff, you know, we have a, we have a six point checklist, but we're not really seeing any home bias. And in some way, this this may be the true form of international investing. The only issues we have is on valuation, right? So how do you compare, you know, a pre revenue company? And most of our companies do have revenue, but how do you compare a pre revenue company in Israel, you know? With just a couple beta customers to a pre-revenue company in Silicon Valley, with just a couple, you know, and the valuations and and the metrics are are are, are very different across markets. So um, we deal with that in terms of helping to communicate and and um, create a certain transparency into the process. But um, those are issues I think that uh, that that I think the mar the the industry will struggle with. Um, I, the the ability. Uh, it's just as easy for for uh, an Australian investor to invest in our crowd as it is an, an American, and and uh, and I think the opportunities and and that ease of use, um, I think, are going to help propel the company the, this in the whole industry forward in the next few years. So we, as as I said before, we are very UK centric, and it's not only because of the the quality deal flow that I mentioned at the beginning. There's also something else which is in the UK. There are great, uh, absolutely amazing tax reliefs for private investors. Uh, I was discussing with someone earlier, they didn't, they didn't know about it. But basically, if it's seed stage, you potentially can invest um, up to £150,000 that a company can get without risking a cent. Because uh, in all sort of, if you're a taxpayer in the UK, you, can get you get 50% back straight away from the government. And then if the, if the business... Uh, after that, you don't pay any capital gains tax. You get 23% back again. Then if it goes wrong, the, the government gives you more money back. So you effectively can get 100% back if the business goes wrong. Technically, 100.5%. So you can actually make money, but the business is going bust, which is a bit weird. Um, <laughs> But then there's a the, for slightly later stage companies, which is what we do. So we do growth capital uh, usually for companies that already have some revenues. Uh, there are some, there are very efficient tax reliefs as well, very similar, but the numbers are not quite as as great. They're sort of 30% and another 25% on top. So it's still pretty pretty good tax reliefs. But what that means is that uh, UK investors will tend to invest in UK companies because they get such uh, uh, so much money back from from their investments and from uh, in terms of tax relief and uh, and you know so far so we've been going on for just over 12 months and we've done um we've helped companies raising uh, 20 million us dollars roughly uh, that's what compares to i would say that uh it depends on the underlying asset you know if you're in fresno i would challenge that you would get anybody other than in the region but uh, in our case, in New York, you know, where, where our underlying assets, you know, have an international appeal, we, we just completed three big deals in, in, the, f in the first uh, 12 months since the Jobs Act, uh, worth uh, an expected value of $575 million. And we raised $73 million from 17 countries and 12 different states. And, uh, and the proportion was probably 60-40, 60% internationals and 40% domestic U.S. It really depends on the underlying asset, as opposed to Colombia, where we only have Colombians and some Venezuelans for the projects we're doing over there. Okay, lovely. Um, we've got a few more minutes, so um, maybe we'll open up. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, we we use all all of our SPVs are uh, British Virgin Islands entities, and they all go into the same SPV. Okay, so they're investing in a U.S. Virgin Islands. Yeah, exactly. I know you spoke uh, before about uh, investor education being important, um, and then people not reading the legal documents. And as a lawyer, I take that personally, but that's uh, it's fine. Uh, I think that uh, um, some of the importance in investor education should be pointing out what to look for in those documents rather than just educating them about the deal. Do you kind of engage as to what they should be looking for so they can tell why your platform might be better than somebody else or why you can see that yours offers this aspect and, and you know they should be looking for that in their other deals? Because I think that's going to help raise the sophistication level of investors and help them to actually look at these documents and make sure they understand what they're investing in. 
Uh, yeah, I, I managed to piss off quite a lot of people in the UK by writing an article on Forbes just about that, uh, by comparing uh, sort of different investor protection levels. You know, um, I'm not sure what the, again, I'm not sure about the terminology here in, from the legal side, but preemption, drag along, tag along rights. Uh, you're nodding us, I'm guessing that it's similar terminology, right? Um, if you talk to, to the average person in the street that has never have you know, has never been exposed to this top of, type of investment. They have no clue what you're talking about. No idea. And no interest either. Because they, what they'll think is, oh, if I put, you know, if I put $10 to, to the next Facebook and it becomes a $100 billion company, then I'm going to make my money back, right? And, and I think that, in a way, that's, that's one of the key risks with this industry is that when that happens, when the next Facebook happens from crowdfunding, and then I've put $10, so I just, you know, I look and I think, oh, all right, I should be doing whatever, 50,000 US dollars, and I put my order for the sports car straight away, and then I get $5 back because of the dilution I suffered due to not having preemption rights, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I don't understand that, and I never understood from, you know, when I invested five years ago, and, and that's when it really hits me. Mm. And that's what I think that the, the education, you, you're spot on. Uh, people really should be educated towards spotting what to look out for, what, what gives them the protections that they should have as, a, as an investor. So one of the ways we, de we dealt with that issue, it's, it's a great question, is that because um, we're also investing in the same deals, we, we pretty much have negotiated all those terms for ourselves. Uh, and so uh, our investors can rely on the fact that we're getting those rights for ourselves, even if they don't really know to look or to understand. Um, the, the first, it's an interesting question. I remember the first time, about half of our deals have been done uh, via convertible loans. Uh, the first time we did a convertible, you know, we got retail investors calling, wait a minute, I want to invest in a company. I don't want to, I don't want to lend money to a company. Uh, they just didn't understand the structure. So we, we do address that. We, do, we have something called Teach in Tuesdays twice a month. We do webinars, and, and a lot of times that has to do with terms and understanding what terms to look for and things like that. Okay, got uh, time for just one, one more question. Um, just to address that, one of the disturbing things for the professionals in the real estate, because it's very different, because the crowd can out, out – um, out curate or out uh, underwrite the, the deal versus uh, an expert. We're the largest shopping center owners in Texas. And the truth was, we would syndicate our deals to the guys up here, but we would keep a certain percentage of them. And you'll never guess which ones we kept and which ones we fed because we knew it and you guys didn't get it. Now, you guys, I mean them. But my point is that real estate is different from that. And I would say you get in a crowd like in real estate, we have associations, but you'll get 200 people, but it's very different from the other side. So I want to make sure we make a distinction is in that crowd, you're going to have 10 contractors, you're going to have 10 wholesalers, you're going to have 10 flippers, you have 10 funding people. And those people combined, it, like they said, they're going to dilute it, they'll get ripped to shreds because they'll put it in front of the crowd and they will get, see, that's the, that's the beauty of the transparency is, is my suggestion is real estate is different when it comes to crowdfunding versus the other ones versus an Oculus or something like that. But I, actually my question was, because I wanted to address that because it is very different because it is our experience and you can't out underwrite the crowd in real estate. I just don't believe it. And, I, and we were the largest. Um, but on syndications, um, or I'm sorry, in the crowdfunding, how important is it for the social component? I know you've had a big social component and something very unusual in doing large commercial and no one's done that before. How important was that to your success on doing your commercial deals? Because it was a big component, wasn't it? The social. It was. It was. I think that there's a big component associated with the behavioral economics of the crowd. You know, I do believe that the crowd is not not going to go for something that has a negative impact on the community. You know, and I believe that the crowd enables us in the so-called crowd economy to, for the first time, line up impact and profit so that people can effectively invest to, through large projects in the solution of their own needs, in particular in an urban environment, just like the skyscraper in Bogota. There was 10 million people living down there. Uh, the city's cramped. There is 1.7 million people working in downtown, and there hasn't been a single skyscraper in over 40 years. And the reason being is that the traditional equity play wouldn't allow it. You as a developer, if I call you and I say, listen, let's put $300 million, 240 at 9% in pesos, let's put 60%, $60 million in equity, and you analyze the 
the traction of the skyscrapers over the past 80 years, over 82% have exchanged hands from the developers, you know, to the banks. So that's a no, that's a that's a loser's game. So and the city keeps growing horizontally. On this case, you know, 4,200 investors out of the million seven that go downtown effectively made possible the first skyscraper in 40 years. And they're making a killing because essentially, you know, there's a pent up demand of a million seven people. So it is a shared value paradigm like I've never seen before. And that's how we address and that's how we address uh, the social impact. You know, we believe in the. We don't like the separation between impact and profit. I think we're done. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, thank you very much to you. We're on the home run now. <laughs>